oversaid anything about Luciano for really addressing all the questions that have not been addressed, especially knowing that your Dutch is very poor, so you don't know what questions are addressed. So will be a little bit difficulty, extra difficulty for you. Um, Professor Luciano Fruidi, maybe you've seen him before. He's been once, I think, at, uh, at the Vincent Symposium. Um, but now he's working at, uh, at Oxford. He is a um, professor of philosophy and ethics of information. Um, he was asked by Google some time ago to help them to form their policy on the right to be forgotten. You might remember the right to be forgotten. Um, so let us get some clear answers from a philosopher, Luciano, please, or confuse people even more. That's up to you. Luciano Floridi. I've been told to stay here so that you can see both me and uh, the slides at the same time. Now, before we start, there are two ways of doing philosophy, only two ways before and after wine. Now, as you can tell, <laughs> we got the wrong side of that divide. <laughs> We're doing it before the drinks, and that, uh, no, from Greek times onwards, has always been a problem. Philosophy after the wine is so much easier. So clearly, Sir Jerry has true faith, both in your ability to stay awake and in my ability to keep you awake before we eat those drinks, finally, so well deserved by all of us. Uh, and by me as well, because all that Dutch was not easy to follow. Now, um, science fiction and reality. Uh, we spent a wonderful day, and I followed uh, some of the points made uh, on the slides. There's so many opportunities and so many risks. A headache for anyone 35 up uh, who sees more risks and challenges sometimes than uh, opportunities. So, uh, in this uh, not short, not entertaining, but long and boring talk that you have to go through before you get to those drinks, I like to highlight a few bits of science fiction, things that uh, we should relax about. And just when you thought that finally everything was going to be okay, dang, a bit of philosophy uh, before the drinks so that we wake up and say, oh no, no, I should be worried. It's just that. A lot of the things you find in newspapers these days, written and said by smart people, uh, are not true. They are decoys there to maybe distract you or sell more books by those people. Now, with a bit of uh, help from the technology, uh, let me show you how old the problem is. Uh, you can all read uh, what is uh, there. Uh, that is uh, Homer. It's a millennia ago, and he's describing uh, well, in the uh, uh, Iliad, these wonderful maidens, of course, uh, who are serving the gods. These are pre uh, sort of AI robots. 20 tripods that were to stand by the wall of his house, and he set wheels of gold under them that they might go of their own selves to the assemblies of the gods and come back again, marvels indeed to see. Marvels. Amazing. I mean, this is. Uh, Hephaestus, who is good at uh, building things, and of course he needs some servants and decides that uh, what better than if not some uh, sort of moving uh, iron statues. So it's an old problem, but that's what it looks like today. We you know, we've moved forward in our fantasies, uh, both in terms of uh, opportunities and wishes and uh, concerns and challenges, and that's what we have come up recently. Partly, and it's a long story, not for today, uh, because we uh, tend to uh, worry about what we don't know. And since the gods are no longer around, we worry about our own creatures. But what is uh, science fiction and what is reality in all this? Well, there's a lot of science fiction, that kind of science fiction. Uh, the one that the previous speaker quite rightly uh, uh, sort of stressed as not for today. You find a lot of again in the newspapers, uh, on TV, uh, and I'm also talking about uh, decent newspapers, a lot of arguments that tend to, or try to convince you that the singularity is coming. That sooner or later, uh, and in fact uh, within a reachable time, robots will take over. That 
the world will be dominated by these uh, networks, by these complex machines that we are no longer in control, that God knows what's going to happen. The first is if then, and actually, all the arguments I'm going to show you, uh, the next three or four, are all from the literature. These are reasonable people who actually very smartly put forward these reasonings to convince you that you should be very worried about this AI Zilla, as I'm going to call it. Well, AI Zilla uh, is if then, what if we create this monster and it will take over and will become more intelligent than us? Then we will be really in trouble. Now, if you are logically minded, you should agree. Yes, of course, if you create a monster, then you are in trouble. But that is also true if you encounter the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Then you are in trouble, and trust me, even more in trouble than if you meet Ad Zilla. But nobody is going to go home and say, oh man, like, uh, I hope it's not going to happen, because it's not going to happen. So the if-then works, it's just that the premise is wrong. There is no if, and therefore the then doesn't follow. So let's take that away. There is no, if Aidzilla happens, then you are in trouble. Well, yeah. But they could. You're not proving that AI, the strong kind, the not David, you can't do that. Kind of, thank you. That's the Aidzilla coming. Um, they could is not possible. Of course it could. I mean, there's nothing in nature. We are, if you are biologically oriented, after all, being created by nature. What prevents us from creating this Aidzilla, this super intelligence, AI, the true one, the one that understands, the one that um, man maneuvers um, meaning, semantics, the one that, for example, we saw interacting with Watson and the bank? Well, could has, unfortunately, two meanings. One is, I could get cancer tomorrow, and unfortunately, that's true. The other one is, this could. You could get a letter from uh, Nigeria saying that you've been uh, left $10 million and please send me... To... Yes, you could. I mean, there could be potentially a friend there you didn't know about, an uncle, who could send you, but would you do anything about it if not being very worried? Of course not. That could mean simply there is no logical inconsistency. It's not like married bachelors. Yes, it is a possibility, but nothing that is remotely plausible. So let's disregard the could as well. There is no if then, there is no could. Knowing the sort of, I could get in trouble tomorrow. Well, you are underestimating the exponential nature of this technology. It's growing and growing and growing, and sooner or later, surely, there's no if then, there's no could, but what about the exponential growth? Well, that's where the Aidzilla comes in. Well, the exponential growth, that comes from The Economist. You might have seen it uh, last Christmas. Well, that's the size of turkeys. And if they keep growing, they will become bigger than this planet. And of course, that's just uh, an extrapolation from very reliable uh, data down here. <laughs> now, the point is that the exponential on the left-hand side doesn't say anything about what's going to happen in the future. Unfortunately, especially with anyone here with a pinch of salt in hair or his hair, anyone who is not that young knows that that's the way the world looks like. That's any business. is a logistic curve. There's a growth and then maturity and potentially you better change business that doesn't work anymore. So that is true for you. Our age, for our income, for anything that uh, has a life. There is no Turkzilla and there is no talking about exponential curve. More on this uh, in a moment. So we need to be careful about extrapolating from growth anything that tells us about the future. But what about sooner or later? Well, you are underestimating. There is no if then, there is no could, there is no exponential, but sooner or later these things are taking over. I mean, they get smarter by the day. Look at what Siri and the next and whatever and Watson, well, it's over there. A few years ago, 2013, uh, someone else from Google, uh, Eric Schmidt, said, well, I've been told by people who know about AI that the Turing test will be passed in five years. Again, five fingers, so five years, all round numbers. So uh, remember, 2018, uh, check out, because by then, their machines should actually pass the test. I will have a bet on this for a moment, in a moment. Then, um, later on, Kurzweil, the very inventor of the idea of singularity, he said, well, no, no, machines will pass 
the Turing test will have super intelligence, not even the Turing test, I mean the real stuff, the not David, you can't do that, uh, sort of uh, uh, intelligence in 2028. That's very precise. Why 2028? Well, because by then it will be 80. So that's a number as any other. And also by the time I'm 80, machines will be smart. That's the way you do science in California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the smart move from Cambridge again. Professor Hawkins. Uh, speaking this year, he said, in 100 years. And why is that smart? Because none of us will be there to check, will they? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so prove me wrong. <laughs> so I could actually say that, uh, no, maybe in um, no, 2215, or add your number, uh, because now, no, it doesn't cost anything. What's the reality? The reality is this. This is the Alan Turing test, so-called Leibniz Prize. They give you lots of money, gold, silver, bronze, to any machine that can actually pass the test. Uh, gold and silver has never been given to anybody. Uh, they now, these days, give bronze to the least badly performing of all machines. And this was this year. Uh, that's the kind of intelligence we're talking about. Question from the you know, smart guy. The car could not fit in a parking space because it was too small. What was too small? Computer. I'm not a walking encyclopedia, you know. No, what I know is that you are a piece of software, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. That is as good as it was uh, in the 1960s, and we haven't made a single step ever since. That is the constraint within which we're working with our smart machines. So that's the moment when we can all relax and potentially have that drink. Uh, I want to have a challenge. I like to challenge anyone who thinks otherwise. I hate aubergine. I really dislike it. And I promise to Menno to come back here in 2018 if that Turing test has been passed and eat in front of you a whole plate of aubergine. Now, if anyone wants to pick up his most undesired kind of food and join me in this bet, uh, we have our wage. I tried with Eric Schmidt, he didn't accept. That's the reality. This is actually the machine that you saw uh, in this morning, uh, uh, kind of eating the hair of that uh, less than super smart uh, human agent lying on the floor while the machine is going around. That's as good as banging your finger on the, with a hammer. Like, yes, <laughs> whose fault is that? Uh, don't take it against the hammer. Um, so that's the reality. That's Roomba uh, for you, and that's how intelligent things are going these days. Very intelligent. We know why. This is sort of Mona Lisa of our age. That's more and slow, now faster and faster, and cheaper and cheaper. That's what computer does for us. And of course, all that generates a humongous amount of data. It is all that processing power, all those billions, gazillions of data that make the difference to the current machines. They're not getting more intelligence, but they talk to each other. And they communicate, and they have sensors, and they have mapping, and there are enough databases around to make sure that already since you know, about five or six years ago, there are more connected devices around than human beings. Now, this data come uh, from Cisco, and they might, suppose, be wrong by 50%. It's still staggering. By the time uh, we reach 2020, there would be just about six or seven uh, gadgets connected per human being. And we are talking about any human being in the world. So people around here, they will have three, four times that number. We're talking about 20 or 30 connected devices per single individual. And this is not science fiction, this is ordinary life. All those blue, green, red lights that you see home when you go back, they're talking to each other, they're not talking to us. Because of all this, we are enveloping the world around the stupid machines. We tried very hard for 60 years to make sure that machines would cope with reality. It turned out to be much easier to transform reality in such a way that they can cope with the stupid machines. If you find this a little bit so confusing, this is what happens in our dear Europe. More than 20, 25 percent of people are online, where they're not in their office or at home. And where the heck are they? Well, they never leave the big computer that is this infosphere in which we live. 
a world that is becoming a big soup of sensors, processors, algorithms, data that make life of the machines easier. So by adapting the world to the machines rather than vice versa, we make them smart, very smart indeed. It looks a little bit like this. This is the world in which we live. To be fancy and use some sort of computer science terminology, a bit of philosophy, we build an ontology around the stupid machine. No one in his right mind, certainly not me, does the dishes that way. No, just with soap in the kitchen. So we build a box around the robot. This is what you are being sold. It's a silly idea. Uh, there is no such thing, and it's not likely to happen any soon. I'm not saying that it's impossible, because the impossible is uh, the wrong word here, but it's not what's happening in the real world. This is what's happening in the real world. A nice hand that puts the dishes in the box, and that's what I want to have for Christmas, because that, that's me at the moment. I'm at the interface between the kitchen and the dishwasher, and I shouldn't be there. In fact, my job should go. Um, are we recording this for my wife in any case? Yeah. <laughs> So that's enveloping the world, and in this big envelope for the world, by transforming the world in something that is increasingly environmentally friendly towards uh, our uh, digital machines, we do have some real challenges. There is no singularity, there are no machines taking over, but there are serious problems. You see, the, the easy thing about nightmares is that you wake up and they are not there anymore. But with real challenges, there is no waking up. The only way is to face them and solve them. So here are the four challenges I want to end up with. A replaceable agency. We heard a lot about this. This is basically jobs. The brown collars have gone a long time ago. The blue collars followed. The white collars are getting there. And anyone you know, who thinks he's wearing gray collars, as in gray matter, you know, should be next in line. So we do find that a bit of a challenge. We are replaceable agent. Now, this um, graph that you find uh, here, and all you have to see even from uh, far away, is just the shape of the curve. Is what happens, according to a recent study uh, done by some colleagues in, uh, in Oxford in 2013, to the job industry uh, in the States on the left-hand side. Sorry, on the right-hand side. You can see that curve, and that curve shows all the jobs that will stay as they are, no matter how many computers that there are around, you're a physiotherapist. You are unlikely to go to a computer to get their massage. And all the jobs that are going, the sort of uh, white collars, uh, the paralegal, for example. But look what happens on the left-hand side. Same study done in Finland, 2013. And it's much more zigzagged. Why? Well, because they took into account social acceptability and legal constraints. A simple example, on the right-hand side, the assumption is that driverless cars will take jobs away from your taxi driver. Left-hand side, assumption. There will be legislation that will not allow that, so those jobs are secured. Two different scenarios, up to us to decide which way to go. No singularity in view. There's a problem there. This is the unfortunate reality um, we all like in this room to think that we are on the very far side of that curve, on the right-hand side. Uh, anything 140 up would do. No? It means gifted. 142, you are a genius. You belong to the top 1% of humanity. Einstein, 166, I think, something like that. Now, these are what they are. I mean, very approximate uh, ways of assessing IQ, human intelligent. But no matter how approximate that is, that bell curve, that Gaussian, is there to stay. There's a limited amount of intelligence in any generation. Lots of people are not necessarily at the top or on the right hand side. And the question to be asked, the sincere, the question that nobody wants to put on a newspaper because it's a bit impolite, is what do we do with the left hand side? once the robots have taken over those jobs. There are several solutions. Um, Bill Gates suggests, for example, uh, to lower salaries to a level where it becomes more convenient to have that silly guy, no, 
wash your car rather than the robot. I'm not sure that's exactly the European way of doing things. Um, there are legal ways. Uh, there are also ways of thinking that, like The Economist, these jobs will be generated somehow. I have the impression that technology gets things every time a notch more difficult. And therefore, there will, no matter how much education and skills we provide, there will be people left behind. But maybe I'm wrong. Either way, we better start planning, because there will be plenty of time to enjoy in the future. Predictable freedom. That's the other disturbing thing. You go back home, and when you open the closet in uh, the bathroom, you bought exactly the same toothpaste. That's so disappointing, so predictable. I really felt free at Sainsbury, the local supermarket, when I bought that, because I thought, best price, I like the taste, it's convenient. Yeah, that's the one I'm going to buy. You go back home, exactly the same choice. If you're rational, the more rational you are, in fact, the more predictable you become. But then, what about my freedom? Well, that's not a problem. It wasn't a problem for a long time for philosophers, as long as there were not machines there predicting our choices and telling us, well, surely you will like this, David. And uh, the predictability uh, cuts deep. Uh, this is not science fiction. I'm not sure if you can uh, read it all the way there, but at the bottom it says February 7, 2013. is archaeology as far as technology is concerned. Department of Criminology, Philadelphia courts begin using computer forecasts to predict future criminal <coughs> behavior and dish out different degrees of punishment. You have your database, you start thinking that this guy is going to do it again, you increase a little bit of pressure because you are predictable. How far we want to play with that predictability, that's up to us entirely. But it is something that the machines will throw at us already and pretty soon. <coughs> Influential autonomy. It's got to do with the freedom. But when uh, we are autonomous and we want to say, buy this or that, choose a particular holiday or uh, a car, well, what happens? Well, this is a graph that shows the growth of what is the global universal spending worldwide, programmatic advertising spending. And this is the right audience. If we were in a philosophy conference, I would have to explain what is programmatic advertising, but not here. It's so bots that compete with each other to make sure that your ad is there at the right time with the right people in the right place for the right price. It's quite a number of billions of dollars, uh, 33. It's, of course, nothing compared to the overall industry of advertising, which is roughly $600 billion a year. That's what Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google are fighting for, a slice of that cake. But what that graph says is that those bots will keep growing in terms of expenditure in order to influence us, our autonomy. They will be there to make sure that we are exposed to the right choices, we are getting the right products, whether we like them or not. So that autonomy is going to be eroded increasingly. And finally, just to round up, dependent delegation. Well, we are, if anything, lazy. We've always been. We were lazy when we were in the caves and we sent someone else to you know, found that mammoth somewhere. So uh, the history of humanity could be you know, written in terms of the history of laziness. Uh, how you take animals to do things for you, um, slaves to do things for you, machines to do things for you. And uh, in the past, it was to do things for you with, instead of your arms, your so, brows, your muscles. Today, we are, of course, really lazy. So we want these machines to do things for us when it comes to thinking and driving and uh, betting on the right sort of stock exchange or whatever. So we are delegating. And that's a natural thing to do for humans. But that delegation happens at such a speed and level and degree and depth that we are becoming increasingly dependent on those uh, machines. Here is a simple example. Smart cities, we heard a lot this morning already. By the time uh, we are in 2050, and uh, I like 2050 because I hope to be there, to be proved wrong, um, about 70% uh, on the left-hand side of humanity will be living uh, in big cities. Now, these big cities are becoming immense infrastructure where the delegation of how things work and whether they work properly or not is increasing steadily by the day. 
who is in charge, who is accountable, the distributed responsibility, and what happens if something goes wrong, well, that is certainly something that we need to plan now, not in 2050, when we will wake up and say, oh, we should have done things differently. So I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions. What kind of infosphere, what kind of new environment do we want to build? We hear a lot about predictions and things that are going to happen, whether you like or not. But there is uh, that amount of freedom, that degree of autonomy that can be exercised. Of course, the older we get, the more we understand that well, there are a lot of constraints. But surely there is sufficient amount of power in our hands to make things go slightly better rather than slightly worse. And it's there that the human sort of uh, challenge is going to be played to make sure that future generations will thank us for putting things right today for them in 2050. Not when they will inherit the problems. Think of, for example, the environmental disasters we inherited from previous generations. And what kind of human projects are we building here? Well, I, I'm just uh, fresh from uh, the UK elections, and there was no human project. The whole project is to put oil in the tank. No one has any idea where we're going with the car. As long as the economy works, well, it's up to you. But I think some thinking and forward thinking is necessary in order to make sure, again, that by 2050, we'll have a decent draft of an idea of how we would like to build our society. So to get there and make sure that this scenario is going to be a successful one, what infosphere, what human project, and three things. We need to think deeper, not faster, for goodness sake, never. Fast thinking is shallow thinking. Design better, because how we design our environment today will influence future decisions. And the abilities of people to do things a little bit better, easier, more successfully, and be mindful. Because one lesson that we have learned is that as long as we care, then we can always go back on our mistakes and make sure that the future will be a better one. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. This is the end. Stay here. <laughs> um, so, who wants to take the aubergine challenge, 2018? No one. You've, you, what have you done? We're not going to get to the drinks any quicker. So, uh, <laughs> someone. I no, mean, no, no. The, the idea is that we don't have any uh, any questions. So. We can get the drinks any a bit faster. And you want the drinks and some aubergine, so no one. So I'm so surprised. I, I don't see any questions. Oh. <laughs> well, you have addressed uh, the unaddressed questions. Thank you for that. But you also have some addressed questions, which we could put down. Uh, we could now project here. Um, and I would. L can you stay here for a little while? Because you did the first part so brilliantly, so maybe now you can answer the addressed questions for us too. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sonne, where are you? Can you come up? So we, we started with these three questions. And, and I'm, I'm making this easy for you. So maybe you could just answer the first and the th third question. Um, so the first question, it's, it's in Dutch. So will machine intelligence be the next big thing? I think you got your answer. Yes, but I just want you to repeat the answer. <laughs> so the answer is that there is just no yes, yes or no, maybe? Or no. Oh. There is no such thing as machine intelligence. It's um, partly an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, uh, partly uh, an emphasis so that we can sell things. I put that in case on a grant if I want to get money. Uh, I can write that in a newspaper if I want to scare the audience. I can write a book about it because it will sell thousands and thousands of copies. But remember, next time you find difficult to connect your printer to your computer, no, that's the <laughs> intelligence that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I will I'll ask the same question to uh, to Sander. Do you have any arguments to counter that, Sander? No, I don't. No, I <laughs> thought so. <laughs> that's settled. I mean, this is a brilliant start. I mean, we are, we are starting to work on this topic. I mean, this is the best thing to way to start. Thank you for that. Um, and the last question: What do you think is the will the impact be? 
of the thing that you just mentioned, which doesn't exist on organizations. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the impact mm. of something that doesn't exist, like, uh, like what's the impact of a ghost, for instance? Well, it could, it could, it could yeah, have a ghost. an impact. So ghosts, still, uh, mm. ghosts are there to remind us about our human nature. So the best thing that this machine intelligence can do for us is to make us aware of what we are becoming, what kind of transformations we are going through. Next time you think that uh, there's a problem because um, uh, you're not online, you're not unable to update your Facebook, uh, or uh, your Twitter is not quite working as it should, well, that is transforming your individual nature, is changing your self-perception. So in the past, just I summarize quickly a point mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. requires more discussion. And you heard me this saying before, so forgive me. Uh, we used to think that we were at the center of the universe. You heard this story. And then no, uh, Copernicus came and said, sorry, uh, that's a comfortable position, but you're not there. So we retrenched and we say, well, we're not at the center of the universe, but we are at the center of the biological game. We are the animals. And then says, well, Darwin came and says, sorry, that's not good either. Uh, move on. And I was like, okay, well, we understand ourselves better. We're not at the center of the universe. We're not at the center of the biological game. Oh, but we are the thinking machine here. We, we really are fully conscious of our thoughts. Uh, we are in control. And then Freud came, and that's the third revolution, so-called in, uh, in the textbook. And he said, well, you're not even fully in control of that either. The suggestion here is that all this technology is making us rethink, as a kind of fourth revolution, who we are. No, Turing and all the rest is making sure that we are not defined by our smart agency because there are plenty of things out there that do things better than us. So we, our human nature, is not the center of the smart agency game either. And I think that helps. It does have us, no, an aftertaste of uh, sort of uh, disappointment, hmm. uh, yes, yeah, I can tell, hmm. uh, but uh, it's understanding ourselves better. So the question that remains here is, who are we if we are not those who can park the car better than anyone else, who can fly the airplane better than anyone else, who can actually land that plane than anyone else, who can play chess better than anything else? Who are we? And that's great, because as soon as we have problems, the jobs for philosophers is secure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luciano. Thank you. I think it's good to end here, and I will turn it to English, uh, to Dutch uh, again. Uh, Jorn was uh, here. Uh, Jorn, is, ben je nog steeds hier ergens in de zaal? Ja, zeker. Jorn, uh, de jongen uh, uh, die jullie misschien de camera onder de neus hebt gestopt met alle antwoorden, en eigenlijk ben jij nu de expert op de tweede vraag. Wij kunnen er wel wat over zeggen, maar ik denk dat jij veel beter het antwoord op deze tweede vraag kan, uh, kan geven. Ja. Voel je een beetje expert al? Of, uh, wacht even, ik heb wel een microfoon hier. Nou ja, met, alle mensen, met alle mensen die vandaag uh, hebben gesproken ben ik denk ik niet echt een expert. Ook nog maar een uh, jong broekje natuurlijk. Maar ik heb vragen gesteld en daar heb ik duidelijke antwoorden op gekregen. Uh, de tweede vraag was welke beroepen zullen er komen ja. en welke beroepen zullen er gaan. Um, nou, wat jullie zelf hebben aangegeven, de beroepen zullen vooral liggen um, in de velden van uh, data. Daar zullen nieuwe beroepen gaan ontstaan. En dat is zowel uh, fijn volgens jullie als uh, schrikwekkend. Um, uh, net als de robotisering. Um, natuurlijk zullen daar banen uh, ontstaan, aangezien ze altijd uh, uh, zullen moeten worden blijven aangedreven of gecorrigeerd door mensen. Alleen worden er ook heel erg veel uh, banen vervangen ja. uh, voor mensen. Uh, ja, robots zullen mensen gaan vervangen in de toekomst. Niet bij alles natuurlijk. Um, Jullie gaven ook aan dat jullie het heel fijn vinden dat er in de toekomst uh, veel vrije tijd is. En sommige mensen gaven aan dat ze dat minder fijn vonden omdat ze te veel vrije tijd zouden krijgen. Aangezien ze geen werk meer hebben. Um, ja, wat, uh... Nou, misschien nog één vraag dan. Uh, is er iemand die gezegd heeft dat er nog behoefte is aan filosofen? Bijzonder? Nee, totaal nee, niet. Nee. Nee. Dat, dacht ik, uh... nee, dat, was toch wel... dat dachten wij ook. Oké, okay, Jorn, dank je wel. Dank je. Uh, gaan echt afsluiten. Even vragen, is Nathan toevallig nog in de zaal? Nathan? Nathan, nou misschien, uh, is er iemand aan het uh, periscoop of meer katten? Of, uh, anders doen we het via Twitter. Danken we Nathan voor zijn hulp voor de conceptontwikkeling hier met alle computers die u ziet staan. Uh, de robotjes aan de kant die hij heeft gemaakt, die de gelijkenis ook moesten hebben van de sprekers. Het is u ongetwijfeld opgevallen. 
allemaal werk van Nathan. Dus Nathan, als je ergens kijkt of ziet, uh, dank je wel. Uh, en als laatste wil ik heel graag uh, natuurlijk Marco Langeweg bedanken, die, uh, die hiervoor zit. Uh, voor al het werk wat zij heeft gedaan, want zonder haar was dit absoluut nooit never gelukt. Dus uh, Marco, ontzettend bedankt voor wat je hebt gedaan. En een bloemetje. En wij gaan aan de borrel. Run past the river.